Hello and thank you for tuning into News Today, where we break down the day's top stories with precision and clarity. Without delay, let's explore the headlines first. An analysis report on candidates contesting the 2024 Lok Sabha elections has been released. Manama declaration calls for UN peacekeepers in occupied Palestinian territory. WTO's members have questioned India's farm input subsidies. CDRI has announced $8 million funding to small island developing states. IIT Bombay will be leading the Daksh project. Earth Cloud Aerosol and Radiation Explorer or Earth Care mission has been launched. Let us begin with the very first news. An analysis report on candidates contesting the 2024 Lok Sabha elections has been released. This report has been released by the Association for Democratic Reforms and National Election Watch, offering insights into the state of affairs in the country's political landscape. One of the key findings of the analysis is the staggering 104% rise in the number of political parties contesting Lok Sabha polls from the year 2009 to 2024. The report also reveals that 14% of the candidates have declared serious criminal cases against them, including charges related to rape, murder, attempt to murder, kidnapping and more. Furthermore, a staggering 20% of the candidates have declared criminal cases against themselves. These findings highlight the critical issue of the criminalization of politics, where lawbreakers have a higher chance of becoming lawmakers. This situation raises questions about the adherence to the Supreme Court's order in the year 2020, which instructed political parties to provide reasons for selecting candidates with criminal backgrounds. Looking at the broader concerns, the report highlights the 100% growth in registered unrecognized political parties from the year 2010 to 2021, raising concern about potential tax evasion and money laundering. RUPPs are either newly registered parties or those that have not secured enough percentage of votes in assembly or general elections. While Section 29A of the Representation of the People Act 1951 lays down requirements for the registration of political parties with the Election Commission of India, the Act does not confer explicit powers to the ECI to deregister parties for not contesting elections holding inner party elections or submitting required returns. In light of these findings, the report offers several recommendations, including permanent disqualification of candidates convicted for heinous crimes such as murder, rape, smuggling, dequity, and kidnapping. It also suggests bringing political parties under the purview of the Right to Information Act and ensuring time-bound trials for cases involving politicians. Furthermore, the report calls upon the Supreme Court as the ultimate custodian of justice and rule of law to reprimand political parties and politicians for not adhering to its orders. Amid the 2024 Lok Sabha elections, this analysis serves as a wake-up call, highlighting the urgent need for electoral reforms and a renewed focus on promoting integrity, transparency and the rule of law in the country's political landscape. Moving ahead in the news, Manama declaration calls for UN peacekeepers in occupied Palestinian territory. In a significant development in international diplomacy, the Manama Declaration recently adopted by the Arab League has called for the deployment of UN peacekeepers in the occupied Palestinian territories. This call aims to maintain peace until a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict is realized. Let's delve deeper into this important declaration and its broader implications. The Arab League, founded in 1945, has always been at the forefront of promoting regional cooperation and resolving disputes. It consists of countries from the Middle East and North Africa, working together to foster unity and address regional issues. Now shifting our focus to UN peacekeeping, an essential tool for maintaining global peace and security. The genesis of UN peacekeeping dates back to 1948, when the United Nations deployed military observers to West Asia to oversee the Armistice Agreement. The primary aim of these missions is to help countries navigate the challenging transition from conflict to peace. The guiding principles of UN peacekeeping are clear and firm. Consent of the parties involved, impartiality and the non-use of force except in self-defense and the defense of the mandate. The deployment of UN peacekeepers is determined by the Security Council through the adoption of a resolution, while the budget and resources are subject to the approval of the General Assembly. Every UN member state is legally obligated to contribute their share towards peacekeeping. The Department of Peace Operations of the UN plays a crucial role, providing political and executive direction to peacekeeping missions. Since its inception, UN Peacekeeping has deployed more than 70 operations globally and was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1988, recognizing its invaluable contribution to global peace. However, UN Peacekeeping is not without its challenges. Troop contributing countries often face issues such as not being fully involved at all stages of mission planning, 
and there are persistent shortages of financial and human resources. Turning our attention to India, a stalwart supporter of UN peacekeeping, India has contributed more than 2 lakh troops to various UN peacekeeping missions, making it one of the highest contributors. In a pioneering move in 2007, India became the first country to deploy an all-women contingent to a UN peacekeeping mission. Furthermore, India established the Center for UN Peacekeeping in New Delhi, dedicated to providing specialized training in peacekeeping operations. The call for UN peacekeepers in the occupied Palestinian territories, as highlighted in the Manama Declaration, underscores the urgent need for international cooperation and intervention to maintain peace and security in the conflict zones. This development is a crucial step towards a potential resolution of the long-standing Israel-Palestine conflict. Moving on to our next news. In a recent debate, World Trade Organization's members have questioned India's farm input subsidies. WTO members, including the United States and the United Kingdom, raised concerns over India's 50% increase in farm subsidies in 2022-23 in the meeting of the Committee on Agriculture. India, however, responded by asserting that its input subsidies were aimed at supporting low-income or resource-poor farmers, which are exempted under the Agreement on Agriculture. Agreement on Agriculture was negotiated during the Uruguay Round and was ratified in Marrakesh, Morocco in 1994. The agreement contains provisions in three broad areas of agriculture and trade policy. Firstly, the market access pillar includes tarification, tariff reduction and access opportunities. Tarification refers to the conversion of all non-tariff barriers such as quotas and variable levies into an equivalent tariff. Secondly, the domestic support pillar deals with subsidies and other support programs that directly stimulate production and distort trade. This pillar categorizes subsidies into various boxes based on their type and impact. Now, before we move on, let's understand about the different types of boxes included under domestic access pillar. The amber box includes supports that are subject to limits, allowing for a minimal level of support as a share of the value of agricultural production. The blue box, on the other hand, comprises support that would normally fall under the amber box but is placed in the blue box if it also requires farmers to limit production. The green box includes government-funded subsidies that do not distort trade or cause minimal distortion. Coming back to the third pillar of agreement, that is export subsidies. Then this pillar addresses methods that makes export artificially competitive. It's worth noting that developed members and developing countries have eliminated export subsidies following the Nairobi ministerial decision of 2015. It's also important to note that public stock holding programs of developing countries are covered under the Peace Clause as an interim solution ensuring that members do not challenge these programs legally under the Agriculture Agreement. As the debate over India's farm subsidies continues, it highlights the intricate balance between supporting domestic agricultural sectors and adhering to international trade agreements, underscoring the need for continued dialogue and cooperation among WTO members. Moving on to the next news, CDRI announces $8 million funding to small island developing states. In a significant move to bolster disaster resilience, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, or CDRI, has announced an $8 million funding initiative for small island developing states, commonly known as SIDS. This announcement was made at the United Nations Fourth International Conference on SIDS, held in the islands of Antigua and Barbuda. This funding is a crucial component of CDRI's Infrastructure for Resilient Island States program, also known as IRIS. IRIS aims to provide technical support and promote disaster and climate resilience of infrastructure assets in these vulnerable island states. The program was initially launched at the Conference of Parties 26 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Glasgow, UK. Moving on, IRIS also contributes significantly to the UN's SAMOA Pathway Initiative. This pathway is a global framework designed to improve the resilience of SIDS infrastructure against climate change and disasters. It's supported by countries like the UK and Australia, highlighting the international community's commitment to these island nations. Let's delve a bit deeper into what defines small island developing states. SIDS comprises a group of 39 states and 18 associate members of United Nations Regional Commissions. Due to their social, economic and environmental vulnerabilities, they are heavily dependent on external funding. For instance, slow onset events such as sea level rise pose an existential threat to these small island communities, often necessitating drastic measures like population relocation. SIDS have been recognized as a special case for their environment and development at the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, also known as Rio Conference or Earth Summit, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. 
Now let's turn our attention back to the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. CDRI is a global partnership that includes national governments, UN agencies, multilateral development banks, and more, all working together to promote the resilience of both new and existing infrastructure systems. Launched at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019 by India, CDRI has grown to include 39 countries and seven organizations. India, playing a pivotal role, is the permanent co-chair of the CDRI Governing Council and Executive Committee. The organization's secretariat is in New Delhi. CDRI is also known for its influential Global Infrastructure Resilience Report, among other key initiatives. In conclusion, this $8 million funding announcement by CDRI is a significant step towards enhancing the resilience of small island developing states, ensuring they are better prepared for, to face challenges posed by climate change and natural disasters. Moving ahead in the news. In exciting news from the world of space exploration, IIT Bombay is leading the charge on an ambitious new project called Daksh in close collaboration with the prestigious institutions like the Physical Research Laboratory, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and the Raman Research Institute. Let's dive into the details of this groundbreaking initiative. The Daksh project is set to build two high-energy space telescopes designed to study explosive astrophysical sources. These telescopes will be equipped with three types of sensors, covering a wide range of energy bands from low to high. This innovative approach promises to open new frontiers in our understanding of the cosmos. The objectives of the Daksh project are truly fascinating. The telescopes aim to detect, localize, and characterize high-energy counterparts to gravitational wave sources. Additionally, they will focus on the high-sensitivity detection and study of gamma-ray bursts, or GRBs. These bursts are incredibly short-lived but emit the most energetic form of light, gamma rays. Now let's talk about the significance of this project. The two Daksha satellites will orbit on opposite sides of the Earth, providing better coverage than any existing missions. This unique positioning will help localize the sources of intense gravitational waves, such as those caused by neutron star mergers. For those unfamiliar, neutron stars are formed when a massive star runs out of fuel and collapses. Excitingly, the project also has the potential to probe the mass window of primordial black holes, or PBHs, for the first time. These black holes are believed to have formed in the first second after the birth of the universe, offering a glimpse into the very early stages of cosmic evolution. Of course, Daksha is not only player in the game of gamma ray detection. India already boasts Astrosat, a multi-wavelength space observatory studying celestial sources in X-ray, optical and UV spectral bands simultaneously. On the international stage, NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope observes gamma rays across a wide range energy, and NASA's Swift Observatory specializes in studying gamma ray bursts. The Daksha project represents a significant leap forward in our quest to unravel the mysteries of the universe. With IIT Bombay and its esteemed partners at the helm, we can look forward to new discoveries and deeper insights into the high energy phenomena that shape our cosmos. In our next news, the Earth Cloud Aerosol and Radiation Explorer or Earth Care mission has been launched. This groundbreaking initiative is a joint venture between the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency with the objective of providing a holistic view of the complex interplay between clouds, aerosols and radiation, yielding new insights into Earth's radiation balance against the backdrop of the climate crisis. Orbiting in a sun-synchronous path, Earth Care boasts an impressive suite of onboard instruments including an atmospheric radar, cloud profiling radar, multispectral imager, and a broadband radiometer. These tools will enable scientists to unravel the intricate relationship between clouds, aerosols, and Earth's radiation balance. With this, let us also talk about the relationship between clouds, aerosol, and Earth's radiation balance. Along with aerosols, the clouds play a pivotal role in Earth's heat budget. Clouds can either cool or warm the Earth's surface by reflecting incoming sunlight or trapping outgoing infrared radiation. However, the extent of clouds' warming or cooling effect on Earth depends on their shape, location, altitude, water content, and particle size. On the other hand, aerosols which are tiny particles such as dust and pollutants suspended in the atmosphere have a direct impact on Earth's radiation balance. These tiny particles affect the Earth's radiation balance by reflecting and absorbing solar radiation and trapping outgoing radiation. Indirectly, they also act as nuclei for cloud formation which has a more substantial impact on the climate. It's important to note that human activities such as industrialization and agriculture significantly alter atmospheric aerosol concentrations, impacting regional climate patterns. 
This underscores the critical need for a comprehensive understanding of the interplay between these factors to better predict and mitigate the effects of climate change. With the Earth Care mission, scientists will have access to unprecedented data and insights, enabling them to unravel the complexities of Earth's radiation balance and pave the way for more accurate climate models and effective mitigation strategies. The personality news for today is Ragoji Bhangre, an eminent tribal leader whose martyrdom was recently observed by the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Ragoji Bhangre was born in Devgaon village of the Ahmednagar district in present-day Maharashtra. He was from the Koli community. He was the son of Ramji Rao Bhangre, who also resisted British rule and was subsequently hanged in cellular jail. Further, if we talk about his Greek contributions, he led a campaign against exploitative moneylenders and colonial rule. He also led the Koli community against the exploitative British government. He was eventually captured in 1847 and later hanged. Through his brave actions, he exemplified the values of courage and patriotism. As we conclude today's main news, let's take a look at some quick updates. India has assumed the chair of Colombo process for 2024-26 for the first time since its inception in 2003. The Colombo process is the regional consultative process that provides platform for consultations on the management of overseas employment and contractual labour. The Reserve Bank of India has launched three initiatives to enhance public access to the central bank and facilitate regulatory approvals. One of its initiatives include Platform for Regulatory Application, Validation and Authorization or Prava Portal. World Employment and Social Outlook, a May 2024 update has been released. This report has been published by the International Labour Organization. The rivers in Alaska are turning orange due to the thawing of permafrost caused by climate change. This thawing releases toxic metals that have been lodged in the permafrost for thousands of years, making rivers highly acidic. The chemical analysis of the river water revealed high levels of zinc, nickel, copper, cadmium and iron. The National Green Tribunal tells Karnataka government to curb illegal sand mining in Sharavati River. It is a west flowing river which drains into the Arabian Sea. As per recent studies, SAS6 centriolar SMD protein or SASS6 genes may be responsible for causing microcephaly. SAS6 is a protein coding gene. It is a central component of centrioles paired barrel-shaped organelles located in the cytoplasm of animal cell. Japan researchers have built the world's first wooden satellite named Lignosat. NASA and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency are collaborating in this initiative. Rudram-2 missile was successfully flight tested from Su-30 MKI. Rudram-2 is an indigenously developed solid-propelled air-launched missile designed for air-to-surface operations. Before we sign off, let's challenge your understanding in today's installment of Test Your Knowledge. We appreciate your company. We hope you found this episode of News Today engaging. For the solution to today's quiz and to access the PDF version of News Today, remember to visit the provided links in the description.